The charter school debate is a big one right now, and even though the session may be over, the argument may not be. Welcome in on this Friday evening, at least for those of you seeing this program for the first time. Sometimes we repeat these Friday shows, but uh, welcome in to my state of mind. Thank you very much for tuning in. We forego the rundown issues of the day on Fridays and uh, have discussions that are meaningful, important, and require dialogue and debate. And tonight, we continue with that kind of approach as we talk about the charter school legislation that is most likely approved by the General Assembly by the time you see this. Full disclosure, we're recording the show yesterday on Thursday. Here's a headline that will give you a little bit of a taste as to what we're talking about. House favors revised charter school bill. And uh, Tim Duffy is the executive director of the Royal Association of School Committees, to my right, your left. And uh, it's, this will be fun because uh, i got to be in third, gear, second gear here because Tim and I don't agree on a lot of the stuff. We agree on a lot of other things, but we have... We haven't had. We haven't been good on this one. You well, and me. crossed the uh, cross swords on this one. Yes, we have crossed swords, and uh, to do more sword crossing is Tim Groves, who runs the Rhode Island League of Charter Schools. Tim, welcome. Thank you. I did not bring my sword, but no, I'm happy no, to have a discussion. No, but I'm sure you guys have sorted. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, a Tim, couple of times. Tim, by the way, is new to the process, so um, he he just I think it would the two weeks or ten days or something <laughs> like that uh, that 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 he succeeded the, the prior director. So he's. He's um, just getting flown into the deep end right away. Are you enjoying it? I am. I am. A lo you know, I'm a native Rhode Islander. Uh, I've been engaged as a practicing attorney. I represented a number of the charter schools, so I'm certainly familiar with the issues. Uh, but I have to say I wasn't quite expecting uh, the, the, the steep learning curve that I've gotten, uh, the baptism by fire since uh, taking over on June 1st. All right. So <coughs> what, what's at stake here? I, I, I think there are two key issues, if I'm if I'm clear. One is the money ain't working out very well right now, that the funding as charter schools have grown, at least this is the argument for change, that the current financial picture in funding charter schools contrasted to the, for lack of a better term, regular public schools, has gotten out of whack with the growth of charter, number one. And number two, local control about decisions. So do I have at least yeah, the two categories of argument correct? And I think they're both related. The third one, the third strand of that, and it's impacted by the other two, is a question of special education. Okay. Um, we fund schools. Hold the thought on that because I want to have a whole segment okay. on that conversation. So in, in essence, the school committees associations and the superintendents association have been arguing enough's enough we want to make some changes. Our position is it's, it's become a dual system, and we, and we can't afford to fund a dual system. We need to establish that charter schools are public schools. They are, and they are part of our system of public education. Uh, they have an integral role in that uh, that was envisioned by the General Assembly in the enabling legislation. They've been around since 1995, and they've been fulfilling that role to be incubators of innovation, uh, to provide education, to try and close achievement gaps. Um, with disadvantaged, socioeconomically disadvantaged students. They have a very clear mandate and they are part of the public education system. Charter public school students are public school students. Make no mistake about it. And in terms of, you know, the funding formula, one of the things we're here to talk about is this legislation, uh, you know, and it doesn't address the funding formula okay, at all. Can we establish and, and agree what the new, pr most likely by the time you're watching the show, the House has approved what the Senate has already approved, and that is a new bill that right. will end up on the governor's desk. And let's talk about the politics of it while we're in the middle of it here. Sure. The chances are that the governor will walk away and not sign it, which could allow the bill to become law over time, or she'll veto. She's got a very difficult decision coming up. What do you think she'll do? Well, you know, if you look at the, the, the votes in the House and the Senate, it's m well over two-thirds. So, you know, she has to weigh the fact that if she vetoes it, the likelihood of them overriding the veto is, is better than 50 percent, probably about 80 percent. So, you know, in that sense, do you want to go down that road and, and essentially veto the bill, have the House and Senate override it? Um, I would think that she may let it pass without her signature. Um, there is a, a, a separate bill that would create a commission to look at the funding. Uh, and then make the case next year in the legislature 
um, that we've got to reopen uh, this discussion and see if she gets any traction. He's there. Do, I mean, he's a veteran on the Hill. Are you are you guessing the same is going to happen? You know, I I don't have uh, a crystal ball on that for sure. Uh, I know we have we hope that if it this legislation were to pass, that the governor would veto based on you know the principles that she's enunciated okay. for herself. So let's not keep everybody in the dark. What does this bill do? What it would do is it would require for existing charters wouldn't be impacted by this, um, but a new charter application would have to be approved by the Rhode Island Department of Education and by a majority of the city or town council where the charter is located and the districts they propose to draw students from. Um, and that essentially is what the bill would do. It would allow for local municipal government to have a say in whether or not a charter is created. Right. So there's argument also, number one. Not number, I'm sorry. It, it, I'm sorry. It would also impact the expansion of existing charters. So if you have a K to five elementary school and you, you decide that you want to move into a, a, add a middle school to that, uh, you would still have to undergo the same process. What about those that are incrementally growing? K3, K4, K5, right. same yeah, thing? It would be the same <coughs> thing. All right. And, and, and it also has a, a funding formula of, uh, aspect to it, or a moratorium on, on spending growth, correct? No, that's been eliminated. That has been from eliminated. The, the, Senate, the Senate provision. Uh, that, that, so, that there's, so there's no there. danger financially right now in this bill to the charter schools? Uh, this, this, this bill doesn't address the funding formula, but one point of order. Or a moratorium. The moratorium is dead. It well, is this is a de facto moratorium, this, this local veto. And this one point of clarification, um, if I'm an existing charter and I'm seeking to expand in the manner that you posited. Take one, two, three. Okay. Uh, if I have a statewide mandate, I still need to get the approval of all 39 city and town councils any one of which can, can derail my expansion. That's that in the House version? actually has been amended. Uh, in the, the version that uh, emanated from the House last night, it allows for those districts to opt out if they elect to opt New out. New charters only. R um, I believe it's on the expansion. I'll have to New take a look at the bill. Hmm. New charters only. There's, there's no such provision for expansions. Okay. You confused? It's okay. Well, w w there's a couple of conceptual arguments that you'll get and it'll fill in the blanks for you when we come back. Stay with All right, welcome back. We're talking about charter schools, the legislation that most likely passed last night, and I say that because we're recording yesterday, uh, and we'll end up on the governor's desk for a signature and or veto, who knows, regarding, you know, the, the changes in charter school. Here, here, here's the thing. The, the idea of, of local control over charter schools is, is a fascinating one. It's one that you and I have disagreed on, but I'm not here to, 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 to be two-on-one with Tim Duffy, not that he can't handle himself. Tim is the Association of School Committee's Executive Director, and Tim Groves is the new Executive Director of the Rhode Island League of Charter Schools. Let me make a couple of, 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 of definitions here. The Rhode Island League of Charter Schools is defined as what? We uh, represent the 18 district and independent charter public schools in Rhode Island. Such as? Such as uh, Blackstone Academy, as opposed to Blackstone Valley Prep, mm -hmm. uh, the learning community in Central Falls, Kingston Hill Academy in South County. And they have been running with public monies for quite a long time as alternative public schools, union teachers, some, 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 some not. not. No, but, but paying into retirement system and complying with you know prevailing wage statutes and all those Subject things. to NEA uh, type of Negotiations, yes, represented by the two major teacher unions, yes or no? Not the majority, no. Okay. Um, independent autonomy for managing the principals, more or less, make all the calls, or a board does, or how's that work? They have governing boards. You know, their governance structure is part of the vetting process in their charter application. Okay. So similar to Blackstone Valley Prep, which has gotten a lot of attention, which is a mayoral academy, mayoral academy. Uh, and there are other mayoral academies that are either sprouted up or intend to sprout up. There's one on socket right now that's in limbo because right. they want th they're, they're half pregnant. They want to go. And this new bill stops them? No, the new bill doesn't stop them. But I understand that the Woonsocket City Council has filed for injunctive relief to prevent them from opening. Okay. Which goes to the heart of what your argument is, at least one of them. Yes. And that is that you think we need local control over 
local government authority thumbs up or down over growth of charter schools in those communities? Right. Why? Well, right now, 55.5% of the $2.3 billion that we spend on education comes from local property taxes. Uh, I surveyed the school districts um, because they're going through their budgetary process now with the local town councils. A majority of them have seen their budgets cut, the requests cut, uh, by the town councils, city of town councils. So that there's an appropriation process. So a school district just doesn't go out there and spends whatever it wants to spend. They've got to go to the town council and they've got to be able to justify those increases. In some instances, uh, they've gotten what is known as maintenance of effort, which is no more than they got the prior year. Um, so what we're, we're essentially, what I'm essentially saying is we can't afford to fund two systems. We're, we're already property tax stressed now. These bills uh, that passed today came out of West Walworth. West Walworth's concern, the city council, the school committee, the legislators, is that a, a mayoral academy setting up, I believe, in Coventry would have drained money and resources from the West Ward school system. Our formula funds at the per pupil cost. What happens The money is, follows the child. Well, it doesn't necessarily. 23% of the average per pupil cost in Rhode Island is for special education. Which will be our next segment. Uh, so, so this concept is driving. Sure. What's your, your response? Well, we don't have two parallel systems, okay? We educate, the charter schools educate about 4.2% of Rhode Island's public school students, okay? And the local spending on public school education is about just under 1.2 billion, okay? So the charter public schools get less than 2%, about 1.9% of that, to educate 4.2% of Rhode Island's K through 12 public school students. You know, that is not, that does, those statistics don't support a par two parallel school systems. You know, one is very much larger than the other. The other one is, I would argue, you know, not taking uh, more than its fair <coughs> share off the table. The money does follow the child. There may be some institutional sunk costs on the district side. There are also inequities, uh, anomalies in the funding formula yeah, that we can I, point I, to I on the, excuse me, yeah. if I can finish, on the charter school side in terms of their housing aid reimbursement, which is dramatically lower than what the public school districts get um, for their there facilities. Is, there are two points there. Again, it's a question of equity. If 23% of uh, the per pupil cost is going to special ed and compared to charter schools where they spend 9% of the per pupil cost, then that money is not going to special ed. It's leaving the district. 73, last year, Rhode Island schools spent $73 million on out-of-district placement. That's the most profoundly disabled students that we have. Charter schools spent a total of 185000 How is that equitable? Well, that's a snapshot at a moment in time. Right now, 13% of uh, charter school, charter public school students have IEPs. The statewide average is 15%. Individual education plans. Exactly. And that those are special needs students. And, and the charter <coughs> school percentage is increasing, trending up year after year. And charter schools are blind lotteries. We take anyone who gets in the lottery whether they have profound uh, and severe disabilities or not. So the notion that, and I've heard it um, you know, many times repeated, and it's, it's not true, that charter schools don't educate special needs students. We do. The percentages now, there may be a slight discrepancy there. And you know, the funding of the severe and profound, uh, profoundly disabled students, there was provision for that originally in the fair funding formula. You know, that's where we attack that. We don't stop, put the brakes on charter schools, the future of charter <coughs> schools, because of that issue, because it is trending in a direction where charter schools are having more and more students with IEPs. And, you know, if there is a statistical outlier or anomaly that we're, choo that we're choosing to look at in terms of <coughs> this one Excuse segment, and, and a costly segment, admittedly. I, I wouldn't say $72 million is an anomaly, first and foremost. Of the found funding formula, I, I believe say $72 it's a million result. Dollars is not, uh, not an anomaly. The original funding formula, and I served on the Technical Advisory Task Force, required the state to pick up um, excess costs over 50000 They've never done it. So, what, so who's paying for it? Local property taxes are paying for it, and we can't afford to do that anymore. As relative to the percentage of, of special ed, ed students, you only have to take a look at the General Accounting Office report on charter schools, in which they say 
they're borderline violating OCR regulations, Office of Civil Rights and U.S. <coughs> Department of Education. Excuse they don't take severely disabled students, and when they do, they generally ship them back to public schools. So, you know, you can say so that the percentages are there. You're, you're a, in Florida, they have five degrees of special ed designations. And the most profound uh, students get a higher percentage of, of funding for the local districts. And, and the mildest get a one, but the, the more profound get a five. You're not accepting the profoundly dis uh, uh, students with disabilities. It's not. I mean, you may have the percentages, but those disabilities are mild compared to what public schools are required to do. And so we so, are not turning students away. We are. It's simply not but, happening. But, but, I litigated <laughs> but cases about here's that. The it's issue. not but, true. But, 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 but it's an obvious replacement. They're not. They, 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 even the school district can't meet their services. But can we I, have can to I pay for them. Can I step in so for a second? Can I, can I step in for a second? No, they're not. They need to have out of district payments. Kingston. We'll take a break, and then maybe I can step in on my show. We'll be right. I apologize. Oh, they're still going. There's no. Wait. You went to the bathroom, but they did. We're uh, coming back next week. I hope you do. I, I, I enjoy the, pu the dialogue on this very important public issue. Tim Duffy from the Association of School Committees, Tim Groves from the League of Charter Schools. If you haven't followed the conversation so far and you're picking up, so uh, foxprovidence.com online or watch the show at 1130 uh, or vice versa because um, I can't go backwards. But here's the thing. The argument... Uh, yeah. During the break, Tim Duffy actually made an argument about the difference between these two schools that I think, Tim, you probably have to respond to. And that is, while you do accept, uh, you do accept special ed kids, you don't say no, you're too, you're too uh, disabled right. uh, on the charter school side. I think Tim's point is probably pretty much on the mark, which is that the grander general school system is getting everybody, including those who are deeply special needs, the likelihood, because charter schools tend to be themed, mm -hmm. there would be a kind of a puree of special education application, in other words, kind of an edited version of special ed coming to your schools. And so that's kind of, if I understand at least the populist argument, that's, that's the populist argument, correct? Yeah. And so can't there be, without all this local control conversation, Tim, can't there be a refunding, we need, a, we need this commission to study what has developed over time with the addition of Blackstone Valley Prep, meaning the mayoral academies, the dynamics have changed that may be good or bad for you right. because it's put additional pressure on what has been a long-term existing charter school system. By the way, are you a fan of the mayoral academies which have changed the dynamic here a little bit? Yeah, I mean the mayoral academies are charter school at okay. bottom. All right, so there's other issues that Tim has with the mayoral academies. Can we all get along on a better funding formula? Well, uh, you know, absolutely. But, you know, the last time we embarked on the funding formula, which I believe the enabling legislation was 2004, the formula actually became effective in fiscal year 2012. So it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that somebody It's hard say. work. It's very hard work. R.C. Wood published, uh, their, their publication was at, at least 80 pages on various funding schemes. And I served on the Technical Advisory Committee that followed up on that. We're still articulating the funding formula now. We haven't finished that process. There are still winners and losers. I think the losers <laughs> still have another five years to go before they get back to some sort of parity. Right, that's, I think that's true. Well, but if I may, so now we have a sample size of some data to look at. We've got some, again, some, some anomalies that have been pointed out that the commission Commission, which just issued its report, the O'Grady Commission this is, just issued their report, their analysis of the funding formula, made no recommendations, um, and, and said here are some, suggested some areas for further study. Now, you know, less than a month later, a couple weeks later, with no further study, we have legislation that comes out that says, Let's, let's place a de facto moratorium on charter schools and let's not address the funding And formula. I think that's, on, uh, yeah, well, I think you've got, your yeah. argument it, it suffers because I'm not sure that there's a pure funding formula yeah. total motive right. here. Just the motive is about, it's about control, editorial control over academia. Just, just a little bit of history here. The, the, the bills didn't come out after the commission. Representative Serper and Rep Senator Satchel introduced that legislation last year. They had those bills in last year. Right. So 
what happened was when they didn't act on the bills, they created the commission. So it's not that the commission created the legislation. The legislation created the commission. But the legislation was revised, I'm <coughs> saying, right on the heels of that with no study, and it doesn't touch the funding. But formula. let's get to the point, which is this. In addition to a funding formula, it certainly needs to be reworked because the charter school world is growing, and so too. Nothing is, nothing is constant. Everything is fluid when it comes to public education. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's a power struggle going on right now between local elected officials, councils and school committees, versus mayoral academies, which I think have, have adversely affected your longer term independent organization where uh, there's some rear ends at a joint right now about what has happened, yes? Yes. yes. And that's affecting you perhaps inadvertently because you guys have been operating kind of on the same, I don't know, Avenue. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think that, that it's safe to say that um, the mayoral academies have engendered a little bit more attention uh, in a negative context. I mean, the fact that the Woonsocket City Council is going to seek injunctive relief to prevent the opening of the Rise Academy in, in Woonsocket in the fall tells you just how serious this issue and, is. And I'm not sure it's about money exclusively. I think it's about, it's well, about op wait, the way you do business charter schools would say, like Dan McKee, the lieutenant governor, would say, well, it's about status quo, players trying to defend themselves, the local school committees that you represent would be like, well, they get, they have advantages, and they, 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 they think they score higher, but they don't. Uh, they get to do things that we can't. They've got kids that want to be there. We don't. You know, that, that thing going it, on, yeah, right? it, it, It's partly that. It's also partly that when the mayoral academy for Blackstone, for Woonsocket, was heard last year in, the, in the, the Board of Education, the chairwoman of that board basically said, we're not interested in about money. And that was after testimony from the town councils in Boroughville and North Smithfield opposing it, the school committees in those two communities <coughs> opposing it, the, the uh, city council and the school committee in the city of Woonsocket opposing it. So at some point when you say, you know, the, 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 the charter approval process requires that input, but if Ride is arrogantly going to ignore local voices and just drop it wherever they feel like it and say it's not about the money when it's very much about the money. Mm. The two communities that we're talking okay. about are on the verge of financial collapse. Give me 30 seconds a version of where you think we're going here. Well, I, I think if, if this legislation passes, uh, then we are seriously, uh, it's going to have a seriously chilling effect on future growth of charter schools here in Rhode Island. What are you and saying to the governor about that? Obviously unfortunate. you're saying that. What are you expecting? I am hoping that she will veto this and that we can look at the funding formula and you know sit down and make data-driven decisions uh, and think about how we can have charter public schools and all the positives that they bring to the table. They are part of a system, a holistic, a progressive system of public education. They are award-winning nationally recognized leaders, our charter schools. And to foreclose them now would be, I think, wrongheaded. A couple seconds to finish. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I view it as a dual system that has grown and we can't afford to pay for it anymore. Taxpayers are absolutely strapped to the max. They're, they. They, they pay for education as it is now. They at least have a say in the local appropriation process. We'll see how it rolls out. We'll see what the governor does. Come back, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It. Final words. Uh, fascinating debate on the school charter situation, no doubt. I will tell you that uh, this debate is going to go on for quite some time, and it'll be really telling to see what the politics are in the governor's office with all that's going on with truck tolls and everything else. Where does this whole thing fit in? Will she veto? Time will tell. All right, listen, program note, because of some production issues uh, in the building, uh, we will not have an original program at 7.30 on Monday and Tuesday. We will be on at 11.30 with some previous pretty good shows, including the U.S. attorney uh, who was on with us recently. So we have a good weekend. Bye-bye.